I was kind of worried we wouldn't have enough people willing to do a lightning talk, and then this filled up rather quickly. Um, now, a question to the audience. Could you raise your hand if you've been at the Poetry Slam before? All right, that's around half of you. So maybe you know already what I'm going to do. I'm at some point maybe going to raise my left hand. And what you will do is you slowly, quietly start an applause. So it's not quite distracting yet, but noticeable. Let's test it out. All right. And then at some point, if the speaker is still talking and five minutes are up, I'll raise both hands. And that means the audience is free to go wild. So let's test that out as well. There you go. All right, that's, I think, all I wanted to say. The stage is yours. Thank you. My name is Michael Vincera. I'm a software optimization engineer at Intel. Um, I'm from the United States. I feel really lucky to be here at this conference. Um, and what I'm going to show you is very simple. Um, it's more or less an insight that you can use. Um, my title here is Efficient Transformations with Panda Data Frames in support of data for web apps. So talking about single page web apps and most, more specifically ELT or what people refer to as extract, load, transform. So the other kind of alternative title that I want to use uh, for this is data frames, they're not just for data science anymore, right? And this should be quite practical. Um, any tabular data you have, any JSON objects, Excel spreadsheets, whatever. Um, they're extremely useful also to filter um, JSON objects. So what I'm going to show you here is a single page web app that I've developed in three different components. Um, but the whole point of it is really just to go through three steps. That is, I don't have a database to start. I'm supposed to build a single page web app and I need to host that web app on github.io. Okay. So the first thing I need to do is create an object, a JSON object. It's going to be kind of what we, what I call a pre-production database. Okay. So this is going to support everything I just said. This is what the output will look like. It's a very simple search index that is stateful. Um, you can play around with it and go to the URL. And basically what, I, what I'm really more interested in is the background process. So how do we create that JSON object? The JSON object, as we all know, we can create it. It just it might have to be validated as a, as a structure. But in this case, um, what we need it to do is we need the JSON object is more or less a go-between. So it's sort of that bridge that we're going to first uh, run a list function, create an array, and from that array, we're going to create a huge JSON object that's about 12,000 lines long. Okay. Now we need to be able to access that from Python and then HTML and JavaScript because in this case, we're asked to use no web framework at all. Okay. So the three simple steps here are create the JSON object, Number one. Number two, load that JSON object as a data frame. In the data frame, filter out all of the <clears throat> column data that we do not need, and then output that as another JSON object. And that JSON object serves as a database for the application. Okay, so I'm not going to bore you with all of the functions here. I'll just go through them really fast. But this is the first one I was just talking about. After we create the list, we first create um, what is what I'm calling here as a pre-production database, right? It's just a huge JSON object. Okay, and then this is really the heart or the engine of it. And it's really nothing that special or new. It shouldn't be new to you if you work with data frames. But basically what this does is it reduces the lines of code of this JSON object from approximately 12,000 and some to about 2750. Okay, so we've reduced it 78% more or less. And you can see that borne out by the data here. Now, I will provide a Jupyter Notebook um, on my site. I can give you my contact information. The Jupyter Notebook just bears out this exact same data. But this is just a simple you know, architectural approach to creating a single page web app. If you have either standalone JSON files, you have a collection of JSON files, you can basically create a master or holistic JSON object, and then work on filtering that object with a data frame to reduce its size and increase the efficiency of the analysis. 
All right. Um, that's all I have. <laughs> Did anyone have any questions? Yep. L? I'm not familiar with L, Jason L. Okay, get with me after. I'd like to learn. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd like to know. Anything else quickly? I guess I have 30 seconds to a minute. Yep. Louder, please. Okay, say one function. Okay, that's good. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> Oh, extra slide. Oh, wait, that's why I have the number in the PDF here. Well, and then I forgot the shortcut. There we go. Um, that wasn't it. Watch a Linux user trying to use Windows applications, that's what happens. There we go. So, I'm Florian Bruhin, and this talk is about how I bought yet another domain, or fstring.help. There was this website, pyformat.info, I've really liked for a while, because it tells you this string formatting mini-language and how it works, based on a couple of examples. Like that. It tells you the old string formatting being person formatting and the new string formatting being string.format. But yeah, there's something it's missing. That's app strings. Someone opened an issue about that in 2015. There was another one two years later. And yet another one another two years later. But that project was pretty much dead, apparently. Then I saw, oh, wait, there is a version 2. Oh, let's check that branch out. Maybe they're doing a major refactoring. No, that was that as well. So at some point in 2019, I thought, hey, why not do fstring.dev and do my own thing, which explains fstrings? Then at PyCon Germany, three years later, I was like, oh, there's lightning talks. I can't tell people about this. OK, let's do this real quick at the conference or at the hotel. Well, the domain was gone by then. And it's owned by Context Privacy Inc. Customer Something. If you're here in the audience, I'd like to have a talk with you. <laughs> it's not even used. So I needed to think of something new. And I was like, hey, F3 would be cool, but 100 euros per year is a little bit much for the choke. So what else do we have? Fstring.cat, hey. It's like on sale, and cat is like a cool top-level domain. But that's apparently reserved for websites belonging to the Catalan linguistic and cultural community on the internet. You know? Like neon.cat, obviously. <laughs> so I ended up getting fstring.help. And what you will find there is an overview based on a couple of examples. You can even launch it interactively with Binder, since it's a Jupyter notebook, and play around with different F-string features. It tells you about things like how to format variables into your strings, the very basics, and much more. It also has a little cheat sheet sub website, uh, thanks to Trey Hunter teaming up with me, where you will find cheat sheets in a kind of table form. And I want to close with a couple of news uh, about f-strings. Python 3.7 is end of life now, which means all currently supported Python versions support self-documenting expressions, where you can add an equal sign after your variable you format into your string, and it prints both the name as well as the value or the wrapper of that value, which is perfect for debugging output. Python 3.12 
added PEP701, syntactic formalization of F strings, where any Python expression is allowed as part of an F string. So despite the syntax highlighter I'm using here, which I think is probably based on pigments, ironically, um, th that didn't like that yet, but you can now add comments and new lines inside an F string inside those curly braces. And I want to close with a lightning talk embedded into my lightning talk. I'm the maintainer of Qt Browser, which is a Vim-like browser, something like Vimium, for example, um, but without all the limitations coming with web extensions. I've been working on it for almost 10 years. It's based on Python, which is why I'm telling you about it, and on Qt Web Engine, which is based on Chromium. I also have some stickers with me for Qt Browser as well as for PyTest, so um, just tell me if you want some. That's all I have. Fstring.help is the website, and you'll find me as the compiler. Next up is Misha. The next one? Yeah, just the next slide. Um, so, before I start with my uh, title and what I'm going to talk about, uh, I thought that I need you to win your attention for this a uh, little bit less than five minutes. And since Doc was already shown, I thought that I need to come with something else. So, Mitch, Murmi, and Blitzy, these are our two cats. Don't worry, I didn't bring them here, so they stayed at home and enjoyed their free time. Now, when you are on board, we are going to talk about interactive maps with statistics. This is also done in Python, so uh, it fits to the topic of this uh, meeting. So before, since we don't have much time, it's only five minutes, I will go right away to the results. What I wanted to achieve uh, in my daily work, I'm a data scientist at work, in a daily life, I wanted to be able to draw such statistical data which are provided by Bundesamt für Statistik, uh, which are available either at the municipality de de uh, level or at such hectares, so squares of 100 meter by 100 meter, over the map. So this is one infamous city somewhere close by to where we are now. And these squares with the color display population in each of these 100 by 100 meter square uh, areal. This kind of visualization is useful because you get some data and you want to understand what is in the data. Does it make sense? Are there some outliers? For example, uh, that square there in the middle of Zurich, does it make sense that it is much higher uh, than the rest and so on and so forth? So such visualization in daily data scientists work are necessary. So at the end, uh, I used already existing tools that uh, do 90 or 95 percent of heavy lifting and made a thin uh, uh, layer of actually a package that uh, allows you to do it in a very easy way. So if you have such a problem, then please use this map with stats is the name of the package. As throughout the slides, there will be QR code that you can scan during the presentation. So how to do it? Obviously, you need some data to display. One obvious way is to do, go to the uh, Bundesamt für Statistik web page. Uh, there is a link there. The slides, as far as I understood, uh, will be eventually shared. So you can find it um, or you can memorize it. I don't recommend it, but still. Uh, so there is, a, uh, for example, here a link to this population data. You click on it, you, you download it, you unpack it. Uh, then you need the package. You can install. Easy peasy. Uh, then you need, of course, to write some Python code. Uh, magic doesn't happen by itself. Uh, so uh, the, basically, you read in some data with pandas. You, there are some helper functions that allow you to uh, parse this uh, standardized data in the format of, of uh, that, pro that is provided by uh, Bundesamt für Statistik to transform some IDs into uh, longitude and li latitude and uh, generate polygons out of it. So this is the first block of, of code. There is some necessary um, uh, technical uh, block in the middle. We will not we pretend that it's not there. And line 18 is basically the whole magic where the map will be built. If you're doing it in your Jupyter notebook or if you're doing it in IDE, uh, you can use this map kind of it is an HTML object. It will be displayed or you can dump it into HTML. So uh, then the next step, obvious step, is to open it in, in the browser or IDE, if you fancy, uh, whatever you want. Uh, and 
in a uh, browser you have this map, you can browse it, there is uh, zoom, there is a kind of, you can, as, you can use it as a Google map or any other type of map. You can uh, uh, navigate through the map and see uh, the, the, the distribution of the data. Uh, I also noted out kind of a stack that is interest that has been used if you kind of find a buzzword that is interesting for you and you were wondering uh, should I switch to it is it useful or not talk to me uh, uh, in the uh, at the upper row and if you forget my face that's how I look like that's the QR code uh, to the package I still have one minute so I guess I still need to talk, keep talking to get this uh, very loud, loud uh, round of applause right <laughs> no don't worry uh, if you have any questions I'm uh, up to take any the, the, I mean, the, the framework that is used in the background, if you provide these hexagons or municipalities as a polygon, it will do it. The point is that the, the, there is a large chunk of statistics that is provided in particular this shape, and there are no kind of easy tools that will allow you to do it. Any further questions? And... Uh, here on the last point, since I have, I guess, 30 seconds or so, uh, there was already opinion uh, in the morning uh, uh, expressed that uh, Markdown is not a good language and you should use Sphinx with restructured text. Uh, I actually am a fan of Markdown. All documentation of this package, as well as doc strings, are in Markdown, and there is MK docs material. That's a very good package. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Next up, we, there you are. <laughs> Remember to hold it close to me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabi, and uh, I am a bookmarkaholic. Around 2009, I started university, and I didn't get into smoking or drinking, but um, I ended up using and abusing this feature in browsers. And maybe uh, some of you are going to ask, why didn't you just sign into the browser? That wasn't a thing back then. And I also don't like my data being synced into the cloud. So it got to a point where recently I realized that I have about 80 of these files on disk. And from time to time, I get uh, overloaded with the amount of bookmarks I have. So I save to disk and start from scratch. Other times I import them again because I, I reinstalled my operating system, so there's a lot of duplication in here. So I decided to open one of these, uh, these, fo these files to see how they look like. And, you know, if you just open the HTML, it doesn't look like anything. Uh, but the, the underlying idea was that I wanted to get all of these in a central thing where I could easily search for all of them at once. So then I looked into the code. This is what it looks like. And the interesting part is, like, for each bookmark, uh, for each folder, you get uh, not only the name, you also get the add date, the last modified date. And for each bookmark, you get the add date and the icon as a base64 encoded image. So there's a lot of information here that you could potentially dig, dig out. So I did that. And I used beautiful soup to do that, to parse the HTML. And uh, disclaimer, you need to use HTML5 lib because otherwise it doesn't, uh, it's not, the other parsers are not lenient enough to, to properly decode this, this HTML. Uh, I used Django just so I could have something quick to, to click on. And after a bit of, of coding and some very, very low effort humor, uh, I ended up having a, a Django app with uh, all my bookmarks in it that I could reference whenever I needed to look something up. And it looked a bit like this, you know, not overwhelming, but it did the job. Um, then I was like, okay, this is really interesting because I have bookmarks going back to 2010, apparently, I, I didn't know. And I wanted to, to do some data playing around with. And uh, I wanted to use uh, this library that I saw at... Uh, uh, PyCon, uh, the European PyCon, and I wanted to use this library because I was too scared to use matplotlib, honestly. And this one I know has a nice uh, API. And I started doing just random things like, you know, total number of bookmarks, around uh, 4,500. Uh, uh, 4, then divide them by years. Then divide them by months of the year. Then divide them by both. And like already just in this graph, you can see that 
uh, there's this period of the year where I don't work that much, and then this other one here, and these correspond to Easter and then the summer holidays, so there's already some insight that you can get. And here as well, like Christmas and New York Eve, and then I was like, okay, let's do top, top 10 domains. And this is cumulative. So you can see like my priorities change over time. So then it's YouTube becomes a thing in 2012. Then I discover Reddit 2013. And then I really get obsessed with Reddit 2014. And yeah, just more of this. And then I was like, wait a minute, but what if I do it per folder? And then, okay, like 2010, learning a big thing university again then learning some more and web becomes a thing that i'm interested in other and web and learning and then software development becomes a thing just as the happiness folder falls up the top 10. coincidence so again this is cumulative so they just add up over time so software dev just increases and etc i can go on but if you do it on a year by year basis you kind of get to see my interest in that specific year and i'm willing to talk to you about that over a beer uh, but uh, the other thing that blew me away was that i can get so much insight into my own life just by looking into my bookmarks over time so like from a data privacy point of view that that really shocked me so yeah that's kind of it any any questions okay no. Imhad is next up there you are Remember to hold the club. Hi, I'm Tim, and I work on Scikit-Learn. And I'm interested in GPUs. So you're thinking of Python, you're thinking of arrays, and you say NumPy, of course. I say machine learning, and I told you what I work on. So you say Scikit-Learn. which, if you ask a lot of people, is a match made in heaven. However, it turns out there are alternatives to NumPy, or so I've heard. So, for example, there's PyTorch and QPy and Dask and Jax and X-Array, and I'm sure there's more. And a cool thing about a lot of these libraries is they can take advantage of your GPU. But none of these work with scikit-learn. And that will make you sad, hopefully. Until now, or at least until now with the parentheses experimental support. Um, this is uh, some Python code. And the important thing for you to take away is that we create QPy arrays, so not NumPy arrays. And then we give them to some linear discriminant analysis estimator thing from scikit-learn. And the output that you get is, again, a QPy array. And it lives on a CUDA device zero, which is a fancy way of saying on your GPU. Um, you need this config context, context manager thing. And that's the, in parentheses, experimental support. And also, we don't support everything that's in scikit-learn yet. And this is uh, where we need your help. Um, there's a lot of work left to do. There's lots and lots of estimators, lots of tools in scikit-learn. Now there's pages and pages and pages of documentation written in restructured text. Um, and we're slowly, slowly converting them or making them so that they can work uh, with all these different arrays as inputs. If you're interested in this kind of stuff and want to help out, there's a GitHub issue. Um, 26024 that you can go to where we list things that would be good for you to pick up to work on because we're trying to keep it a little bit organized and uh, direct people towards things where we're fairly confident that it can be done because there are parts of scikit-learn where we don't yet know how difficult it would be to make a trans uh, make this transformation um so with that and buckets of time to spare uh, thank you very much
and you can ask me questions, but not now, afterwards. You still have one and a half minutes if you want. <laughs> Enough for one question or two, I suppose. Yeah, oh, let's keep going, no? You or me? Me, whoops. <laughs> And last but certainly not least, we have Stefan. Here you go. Remember to keep the microphone close. All right. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So I'm uh, Stefan, and I'm very excited actually to talk to you about Vega Altair. But, but what it is, for those of you who don't know it, but also some new things. So, what is Altair? Altair is a a Python package to do visualizations, state visualizations. We've already seen Maple Live in the morning, we've seen Visa before. What is special about Altair? Well, one thing is it has a declarative API. So with declarative, I mean that you specify the requirements for your chart, but you don't have to tell the library how to actually implement it. So no for loops and stuff. So basically, you just import it, you pass it, for example, a panda data frame, you say that you want to um, plot the data points with circles, then you encode on the x position to the horsepower column. You encode the miles per gallon column to the y position. And then you say for every entry in the origin column, you want to have a new subplot on a row. And so that gives you basically what you have on the right. And this is sort of in contrast into a more imperative style that, for example, Mapplotlib has. Now, more reasons to love it. Um, apart from being a declarative, it is also composable. And with that, I mean that you can learn sort of things that you learn in one corner of Altair, you can pretty much apply also in another one. And you can learn like small things and then compose it together to build bigger and bigger and more complex visualizations. But you can start very simple if you want that. And it's not scary, I promise. And there's also flexible interactivity. I wasn't able to show it on the PDF here, but basically you need to trust me and also look at the documentation maybe. Um, on the right side, we see you can select some data points and the histogram at the bottom updates it. You can do all kinds of things and it works well with web applications. And another reason, very important, popularity. And mainly because you can find a lot of resources online on Stack Overflow and so on. Just to showcase this a bit, these are PyPy uh, stats per month downloads as a proxy. And it's sort of second to Matplotlib. So there's a lot of material and there's a big community around it. Some new developments we, have, we released in Altair 5 and 5.1 are actually you can now also access these selections. So if you select a few points on a scatter plot, you can access them in a Jupyter notebook and then filter your pandas data frame with it. Very convenient. Much easier to um, export static images, PNG, SVG, with a revamped documentation, also written restructured text. I would prefer Markdown. Um, we support data frame interchange protocol, sounds technical, but it means that you can pass in not just pandas data frames, but also if you work with polars, DuckDB, all kind of things. We have significantly better error messages than before, before they were not great. Now they are. And some other things I want to highlight, one is Vega Fusion. With Vega Fusion, it's a, another package which works very well with Altair. It's like sort of integrated in Altair 5.1. And um, we can transform data in the Python kernel. And with this, it really scales to millions of rows. And you can even push these calculations in a very easy way to databases. So for example, if you use Snowflake as a data warehouse, you can push calculations for histogram into Snowflake. Another thing that I've been personally working on is Altair Tiles. We love maps. We've seen a few already today. And Altair Tiles gives you the ability to add base maps. So for example, OpenStreet from OpenStreetMap to your Altair visualization in a very easy and convenient way. Caveat is it's an early development. So first reason is not out yet, but expect it soon. Let's see. That is all I want to say. You can find the documentation there. It is great. You can file issues if you find them on GitHub. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. And I actually speed approve because then I have one minute for questions, which I thought could be fun. Yes, please. Yes, very good question. What is the license? What's the question? It is BSD free. So yes, it is open source and free to use also for commercial use. Yes. Any over there? Yes. Yes. 
Good question. You might have noticed if you take Wonderplus as sort of started the whole project uh, together with Brian Granger, and um, then there was a bit of a slowdown in activity, and now it's sort of a new team that took over. So we're sort of four, five core developers, I would say. Sorry if I can't see you, but... Yeah. Yes, so how it's rendered, um, Altair just produces bigger light specifications, which is sort of some for JSON, uh, JavaScript, and then there's a JavaScript library that basically renders it, yes, exactly with this, but it works in Jupyter Notebooks and all kind of environments, but also in web applications. And I see a zero, so that's it. Um, that was it pretty much. One last question to you all. Um, so I have an idea for next year. Could you raise your hand if you would have done a lightning talk if there were more slots? That's two, four, six, eight, ten or so. Okay, definitely going to be more space for them next year.